now. How you doing, Bill? I'm doing great, Kev. How about you, brother? I'm doing awesome. It is good to be getting back to uh, sort of sort of normal. And you're in a different uh, location, at least oh, in no, the no. house, anyway. The same location, just different part of the house. <laughs> so, different background instead of the boring white the boring white wall. I actually thought about going outside, but I know as soon as I do that, they're going to start mowing the lawn or something. So. Yep. 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 Yeah. And uh, happy Cinco de Mayo. Yes. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Actually, today is uh, at my house. We call it Seso de Mayo because it's my wife's birthday. So we. Oh, wow, happy birthday! Please pass that along. Very start cool. Around the, the, the fifth, and then uh, just keep going through uh, to the end of the sixth. So. Great. And hey, uh, since we did our last. Uh, podcast. We are now actually um, like living in the free world again. You can actually go out and uh, eat in a restaurant and uh, that's been uh, terrific, at least here in Texas and I know in Florida, y'all. Yeah, for most of well. I, guess, I guess 43 states is what they said. That leaves uh, seven states that are still having to get back to some sort of normal. I know New York and uh, California are two of those. I don't know about the others, but uh, it's just crazy. Oh, Michigan. Michigan is one of those, those also. It's just crazy what they're doing out there. Just, just, I mean, fighting to, to get back to, to normal, to what we should have every day anyway. Yep. You know? Yeah. And, and it's, it's like, it's, you know, they have to fight for, for the right to have a normal life. Yeah. And it's it's kind of sad, but that's a whole nother political show for another day. Absolutely. It is. So, Right. But uh, today we wanted to talk about uh, foreclosures because our yeah. last show was about pre foreclosures. So I'll let you kick it off. Actually, let's let's explain to people the differences because we did the pre foreclosure. But anybody who missed pre foreclosure, pre foreclosure is different than foreclosure. So the difference is, and people just hear foreclosure and they just kind of think it's all the same thing, and it really isn't. Pre foreclosure is before someone is actually out on the streets, their house has been sold at auction by the bank or by the trustee, and they have the option of doing something else to save themselves from going through all of that. They're still gonna have to leave their house, okay? But they have options, they could even walk away with money in their pocket. That's pre-foreclosure. That's before the bank gets their hands on the property. Foreclosure pretty much starts at the moment that the bank or a trustee or an attorney or whoever it is shows up with that deed at the courthouse to sell that property for what is owed on that property. Yeah, it is a, uh, it is a pre foreclosure until the minute it is sold, then it becomes a foreclosed property or a foreclosure and the bank or the mortgage company um, owns it at that point And, this is a, a major part and has been for, I started this business in 92, um, has been that whole time is buying from banks and mortgage companies on property that has already been foreclosed on. Uh, we went through the whole pre-foreclosure thing and how we can work with people and help them uh, to save credit and, and um, be able to get some cash out of their property still. Once it's gone past that point and now it's been foreclosed this is where uh, i do a ton of this with the banks and mortgage companies yeah i, I talk about yeah uh, this is where you draw your sword and let the blood fly where it may because when i'm dealing with an institution you've got no emotion involved when we're in pre-foreclosure a lot of emotions involved because we're dealing with individuals when we're dealing with an institution no emotion, it's pure numbers, numbers only. And if they turn us down, that's fine. They turn us down. Um, the, I have a, a, a property that, um, that I did a couple of years ago that has the biggest gap from the first turn down I got till I bought the property. I went after the property in January and the bank turned me down, not interested. Oh, the agents, oh, they'll never take that. Okay, fine. I bought it in September. And I bought and it from percent, the bank. Nothing happened in between. And obviously the bought it. The, the percentage difference between. I bought it for about 12% less than uh, I originally offered them. And I called the agent back because the agent did not act like they had remembered anything. 
Now, when they were, when we were dealing with it. So once we got closed, I called the agent back and said, you know, I, I tried to buy this back in January, uh, which would have made you look better. Would have had the bank a little bit more money, uh, but it was fun. So you know, mm -hmm. when we're dealing with the bank, we just, this is all about, there's not a lot of variables in the straight foreclosure side of it. You have to look at, do I have my money lined up? If I've got my money put together, then I can go in as a cash offer and that's going to give me an edge. Uh, it's really funny. Um, a lot of our purchases are cash uh, offers. And then when the offer is accepted, we may have two weeks in there as a, a close period. Uh, and when the offer is accepted, then the bank comes back and they can't close in two weeks. They, got, they still have to have 30 days, which is pretty funny, but it gives you an edge if you're in a position now you got to prove that you can be um that you can pay for the property so that you can make a cash offer you just can't go in and say oh it's going to be a cash offer so when i have my money lined up and i can show proof of funds then i can go in and make that as a cash offer that's going to give me an edge over somebody that is having to get financing that's a key play when you're in the foreclosure side of the world yeah, the agents like working with you better and the banks like it better because they will accept sometimes less money on a cash offer than they do on a financed offer because they don't have to worry about the deal falling apart. And so, another, another thing to remember too is when you're putting your financing together, okay, uh, you have the issue of many times with the bank, trying to get the gallery to be going, uh, many times with the bank, you have, uh, they're going to say no, no disclosures because they're really not able to make any because they, they didn't live in the property. You know, no disclosures, um, as is, where is, you know, they, they have no guarantees on the property, no warranties on the property or anything else. Uh, you can still do your inspection. You can still do a lot of those things, but a lot of lenders are going to have a little more of a disparity lending on that situation. So you're probably going to find a lender, but you're probably going to pay a half a point or a point more in order to get that lender to want to be able to jump through those additional hoops for you. And the lender also knows that it's a foreclosure. They also know that there's, there's issues that are unknown that you're going to be getting into. So that's really what I'm, I'm building up to is if you have either your own financing money in the bank or you have a investor lender behind you who lends on these types of properties who is there to literally guarantee your loan because they're familiar with the ins and outs of this it, it, they don't have to think inside of that that fha box and when i say fha box bill knows what i'm talking about loans that are made from a bank have to conform to fha guidelines typically have to conform to fha guidelines because they want to be able to sell it eventually to, to the Fed and be able to clear out their mortgages. So if they're not fitting each one of those check boxes, then the lender is going to be more weary, if not just not interested at all. So having, having partners that can put that money up for you, if you don't have it yourself, is a key part of this process. Yeah. Don't just say, oh, I can go get a, a, a foreclosed property and you know, think that it's as simple as, as getting a regular property. It really is not. It is a um, terrific value opportunity. Um, most of the time when property goes into foreclosure, it has been neglected most of the time uh, for a few months, if not longer. Uh, and so it may have some deferred maintenance that needs to happen on the property, which helps drive the price down. Uh, I'm always looking for defects in the property, not just from a buying standpoint to understand what has to be done, but that gives you a value standpoint. Here in Texas, we have a ton of foundation issues. So a lot of people, uh, especially people that move in from out of state, they're just like, oh, I, I don't, it's got foundation problems. I don't want to buy it. I'm like, well, you're probably not going to do much business in Texas, but if you know how to handle that, yeah, not only does it not bother me, it becomes a magnet. So those are great properties. You get a, a helps push the price down on the property with the institution. And then, uh, as you said, on these inspections, sometimes you're going to have to sign a waiver uh, to be able to get water and power turned on just long enough to do an inspection even. 
Now, I know HUD's requiring that now. Yeah, so you take a look at, you know, can I have this property inspected? If it's a property that um, you have got a, an offer accepted on, then get in there and get the inspections done quickly. And if you get something that comes back that's really um, bad, typically you're gonna have a seven to 10 day window for inspection. So your inspector can go in and if something comes back that you missed when you were, were looking at this deal. And I'll, I'll give you a, a prime example. I had uh, entered into a contract to buy a property. It turned out to be one of my favorite rehabs. So I entered into a contract to buy this property. And the day before our close, I got a call from the agent representing the bank and she said the property got vandalized yesterday. And I said, okay, well, the property's in pretty bad shape to begin with. I'm not real sure what, what all they could have done, but I'll go by and take a look at it uh, and see. So I went over to the property and what had happened is somebody had come in and they had ripped all the copper out on the wiring. So they had, had gotten into the electrical panel, pulled the panel, uh, basically stole the panel, ripped a bunch of copper wiring out of the property. Now, here's a key point. When you are dealing with electrical and that electricity has been cut off on a foreclosed property, many times the city will require an electrical inspection before they will allow you to have the power turned back on. And right so I, I called the agent back and I said, hey, um, I still want to buy the property. And she said, okay, great. You know, tell me what kind of adjustment we need to make in the price to account for this. And I said, oh, no, no, no. I want you guys to go in and have the electrical repaired. And she said, well, it'd just be a lot easier if we just come up with a number. And I'm like, no, we're not going to come up with a number because I've done this before. The city's going to have to okay the electrical on this. And we could say $2,000 for what was done in the, in the vandalism and then the city get in there and find all kinds of other things. And it cost me five or 6,000. So you go fix it and then I'll buy it for the price that we stated. Well, we went around and around a couple of days and finally the seller came back and said, Hey, we'll, we'll repair the property. And sure enough, when the inspection came in, the city made them go back and rewire half the house and it would have been a lot more than what we had talked about as a discount. So look at your inspections. You get it under contract. You got a seven to 10 day window typically to be able to go in and have that property looked at. You may have to have the utilities turned on. When you do that, you need to let the utility provider know, hey, look, this is a, a, a rush deal because I'm buying this property. If I can't have the utilities inspected, then I'm, I'm gonna cancel the deal. How soon can you get out there? And typically I found them to be very helpful to wanna get out in the next 48, 72 hours get the water turned on for you, get the power turned on, gas, whatever it happens to be, so that you can have that property properly inspected. But that's a, that's a key play in buying foreclosure properties and making sure that I do it once the property has been accepted. I don't do it prior to right. contract acceptance. So you gotta make sure you remember that because that could get very expensive uh, over time. But once we have a contract accepted, um, if it's a property that, and when I was yeah, much newer in the business, I did it all the time. It's, I don't do it near as much now because of just the amount of experience. But if you're new or a newer, then you want to have that inspection done. That protects you and can save you a ton of money. And something else I've noticed, a lot of times when you get a foreclosure, not only did they not pay their house note, they did not pay their utilities. Okay. Um, certain cities, certain counties will actually make the new homeowner be responsible for that. Mm -hmm. Banks will not carry that over. They will not pay that out. Uh, another time, another thing that I'll see is the utility companies will literally pull the meter because mm -hmm. the people who were living there were, were tampering with it or doing whatever else because they didn't have electricity, they didn't have water, they didn't have gas, whatever it was. If your meter is pulled, depending upon where you are, different cities, it's really easy. They'll come out and they'll put another meter in. Other ones, they charge you an arm and a leg. You have to wait. You have to do inspections. You have to do all kinds of different things. If you are missing meters on your property, make the owner responsible for replacing those meters. Let them know, I need those meters replaced before I can go do an inspection. Because you don't know what could happen when 
you're going to have to be responsible for doing that. And you don't want to have to put those meters in place just for an inspection and pay all those fees, pay all those fines, pay everything else just in order to be able to inspect the property. And understand that a lot of times when you're dealing with the bank or a mortgage company, they're just going to say no. A lot of times they're just going to go, it is what it is. That's where it is done. You want it fine. Don't that's fine. So understand that going in, it never hurts to ask. And if you will simply do that uh, on the front, just always ask. That's the, the thing uh, I try to stress with all of my clients uh, is ask, ask, ask. The worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to say no. So just ask and uh, you might be surprised how many times that you can get them to agree to something that it'll surprise you yourself. And if they don't, always remember, this is about your bottom line. When you start putting more money into this property, this is cutting into your profits. So if you're going to narrow your profit margin, if this is a skinny deal to begin with and you have to do all these extra things, walk away from it because there are going to be more deals coming along. So many people see, they just fixate on the deal and say, I got to get this, I got to get this, I got to get this. And they become competitive about it somehow. And it's just not worth it. Especially guys. Always stay true to the number. And I, I used to see back in back when we were going into the mortgage meltdown, I used to see people bid more for properties than they were worth because they were going into foreclosure. Literally on the steps of the courthouse, bidding more than the property was worth because it got competitive. And it's just, it's stupid because yeah. at the end of the day, as an investor, this is money in and out of your pocket. So the more money out of your pocket, this is gonna be the less money in your pocket. So always have your bottom line. Don't go over it at all because guess what? There will be another property that comes along. There will be another project that presents itself. All you have to do is be open to that. Don't become fixated on just, just this one single project. If you don't get it, life moves on. Yeah, one of my uh, mentors yeah, through the years has said, you know, hey, the greatest real estate deal ever comes along every 10 minutes. So, yeah, I, and, I tell people the opportunity of a lifetime happens every single day. Yeah. The, only, the only thing is you have to be able to recognize it. You have to be ready to act on that opportunity. The people who always say, oh, you're lucky you did you got this. Oh, you're lucky you found that. And oh, man, how lucky. It was because I had my eyes open and when I saw the opportunity, I acted on it. People see those opportunities all the time. I also hear people say, you know what? I had a chance to do this or I had a chance to do that. Yeah. I'm like, why didn't you do it? Why didn't you do it? Oh, well, I took too long to think about it, right? Those aren't opportunities that you're able to take advantage of. Act. When you see an opportunity, act. Don't let anything stop you from taking advantage of a good opportunity and look if the numbers work make the offer if you get an offer accepted and you don't have funding put together yet you've got a little bit of time between the offer being accepted and the close date to go get your funding squared away uh, if you if you had it marked as a uh, financed offer third-party financing on your contract and now you've got a little bit of time to go get that money put together, whether it's private or, or lender, or whatever. But you are in a position that is very different once you have an executed contract. And if you're talking private money, that's a night and day difference with a private lender when you can say, look, here's the property. This is not something I hope to do, want to do, going to do. Maybe I've got this property under contract. I think it's a great deal. Here's how much money I'm looking for. Here's what I'm willing to pay for it. And you know, sometimes I let them go by and, uh, you know, look at the property if they want to. Most of the people that I do, the overwhelming majority that I do with private money are people who are not real estate investors. They love real estate. They want to be involved in real estate. They're just not interested in becoming investors. And being a private money source allows them the ability to be involved, make a good rate of return, and it helps us out tremendously. Um, I'm going to tell you, as your business grows, you will get to a point where no bank is going to touch you. It doesn't matter. I, I pay everything on time every month. That immaterial, once you get to a point that your debt to income ratio gets out of whack and with real estate investing, that can happen pretty quick. Uh, then what happens is you've got to have an access 
to private money, access to, to hard money, a lot of different options. So uh, private money is a, a wonderful way to go when you're dealing with foreclosures. Yeah, and if you don't personally know somebody who can do this for you, there are companies out there. This is what they specialize in. Like I said, an investor loan, you're gonna pay a little bit more. It could be half a point to a point more. Um, but if you don't personally know, like the neighbor who wants to, to back you financially, if you don't personally know, get on the internet and do an internet search, okay? If you have reasonable credit and you've got a reasonable down payment, you'll find a company that's willing to put the money up because your prop, the property that you're purchasing is their security. So if you've got the down payment and you've got the credit, again, for an extra half a point or an extra point over what a traditional purchase would cost, uh, you're going to be able to find somebody who can finance this deal for you. So if you have your ducks in a row, in that particular case, it's your down payment and, and your credit, don't be afraid to go out there and make an offer on a property that you maybe don't have financing for right now, because there are plenty of commercial companies out there. Yep. That this is their focus. They just want to work with investors because they like that extra half a point. They like that extra point that they're not going to be able to get in a traditional home loan. And when you're doing bigger deals where you're doing commercial or multifamily, uh, when you go search on Google, you can look for the phrase asset back lending or asset based lending, either one. Uh, and basically it, it works the same as hard money on a, on a single family house, but you can do it on significantly larger, you can do it on a 20, 30, $50 million deal. Yeah, uh, now there, there's some other things they look at but it's mainly based on the asset. And that's what you, you can always keep in your back pocket from a real estate standpoint. If I don't have the cash or credit myself, I have control of an asset, which is this property I have under contract. That asset allows me to be able to go to private money, hard money, even just traditional bank lenders and go, you know what, here's this asset. I've got it at a nice deep discount. It should be in a position good enough that you you can move forward and put up the funding for me. So let's talk about how they're going to find these foreclosed properties and how much information they're going to be able to have on this property going into this property. Because on a foreclosed property, unless you spoke to the owners, okay, before it went into pre-foreclosure, you, you're, you're not able to get into the property to see what the condition is or anything else. So if you're buying this property on, on the steps, okay, and this is just part of the foreclosure process is on the steps because you can also get it from the bank, but if you're buying it on the steps, you have, you've not seen this property. You don't know what you're getting into. I like um, making sure that, and look, a lot of people get freaked out about inventory. There's so much inventory, even in a great market. And, and Lord knows since uh, the end of 2012, we have had a great market. There's still a ton of inventory out there. And what I like to do is just stick with, when I'm buying foreclosure property, I wanna stick with the properties that are vacant. So I can get in and go look at them. And that gives me an idea as to the condition on the property. Gotta be able to, to feel that. If it's an occupied property, then you've got a whole different thing going on. You know that you're gonna have to go through the eviction process. Uh, who knows what they're gonna do as they move out the damage that they may um, inflict on the property. So up until that point, all you're doing is just driving by the property. Um, I really personally stick for the vacants so that I can get in and take a look at it. And Bill brings up a good point. A lot of times when these people leave, they will pull the carpet out because they think they're gonna use it in their next house. I've seen where they've taken out the cabinets, the countertops, the, the, the toilet fixtures. And a lot of people, and I know Bill's seen this too, they'll just turn the water on, they'll plug the sinks, the bathtubs, the toilets, and they'll just let it all run and they, because they're angry at the bank, okay? It's their fault that they didn't pay the note for whatever reason it was, good people, bad people, whatever. Good people don't do this, good people walk out and they leave the house the way they, they got it, okay, or the way it was. Bad people, I've seen extra tens of thousands of dollars worth of damage and just water damage, not counting things that were ripped out of the, the, the unit, you know, to out of spite or because they thought they could sell it or who knows what it was, okay? So you don't know what you're getting into if you're buying on, on and 
what, what Bill is talking about is buying it when it's been listed by the bank already, okay? But technically a foreclosure starts when they're selling it at the steps. And I know people who show up on the steps in order to buy these properties. And the bank, the representative from the bank, the trustee, the lawyer, whoever it is, will show up with that deed in hand, okay? And sell that deed to the highest bidder that bids over what is owed to the bank. Then that property is yours. Lock, stock, and barrel, dealing with the people who are in it, dealing with you know getting them out, dealing with calling a, a marshal or a sheriff or whoever it is, depending upon where you are, to, to serve them notice that they need to leave. Okay, That now becomes your problem. Uh, so what Bill likes to do instead, okay, and a lot of people figure that there's going to be less of a margin for profit because once the bank takes it back, the bank has to put money into securing the property, the bank has to take money into managing the property, the bank has to put money into different things. Once the bank gets it back, okay, it may have gone for sale in January, the bank may not list it until June or July because it sits on their books until they need to, for whatever reason, clear it out or until they have an agency that's assigned to selling it. There are costs of holding that property. They have to pay, uh, they don't pay HOAs for some reason, but they'll, they'll pay the taxes on it. They have to, they have to pay uh, whatever it is that's owed on that property in order to maintain that property so that they don't lose it to yeah. the county or they don't lose it to an HOA, you know, lien or whatever else. Or, and they pay insurance so they don't lose it to fire yeah. or... Uh, storm damage or anything. Uh, you were talking about good people, bad people. And you can still buy vacant foreclosures on the steps. Uh, I, I will drive by. Um, typically, I get the foreclosure list a, a good two weeks prior to the sale. So I've got time to, to do a little homework on these properties. One, to see what I want to bid on them, but also to physically drive by and uh, you can almost always tell, you know, if they moved out or not. A lot of people that are uh, good people that have just had something bad happen to them financially, uh, they will go ahead and move out. And they're walking away, losing the property, but they will move out. A lot of, by the same token, a lot of people are a little more bad intentioned and they will stay in and make you evict them. So I like to just do a drive by uh, and see. If I think it's vacant, uh, then I'll walk up and, and knock on the door. And a lot of times it's very obvious that it's vacant. So then I know I can get an opportunity to get in and see that property on the inside. But I, I want to do a drive by before I start bidding on it so that, you know, we have an old uh, Southern saying, buying a pig and a poke. I, I don't want to buy a pig and a poke. I want to have some idea, even if it's just a drive by, because if, somebody's there, the condition that it's in right now may be a very different statement from the time they move out. And look, you can get some really terrific buys on these people that are, are well, they're just pissed off. Uh, they're mad at the world because apparently it was somebody else's fault that they got foreclosed on and not theirs. And so they got all mad and they damaged the property. That property plummets in value because banks do not want to spend money on being, bringing a property up to selling. They want to walk away. Uh, it's good money after bad. Banks are big time believers in they don't want to put any good money after bad money. They've already made what turned out to be a lending mistake. They don't want to spend more than uh, any more money on this property than they absolutely have to, to be able to market. They'd rather take a a uh, lesser price on the property and even a loss. It's what a lot of people miss. Kevin, I know you know this, but banks look at a property very differently than you and I look at it. So I, I've had um, consulting clients that'll go, well, they're not going to take less than their own on it. Oh yeah, a lot of times they will. And the reason they do that is because they're carrying this debt on their books, this note on their books as a non-performing asset that non-performing asset affects the amount of money that bank can lend. Now, I'm gonna throw a couple of numbers out here. 
and look, it's a little more complicated than this, but it works, for example, and, and it's fairly close. Banks typically have about an eight to one ratio uh, based on their deposit base of what they can lend. So if they've got a billion dollars on deposit, that gives them a lending ability of about $8 billion. Now, it doesn't work exactly the same way when they foreclose and now they have a non-performing asset, but it works very similarly. So if I've got a, a half a million dollar house on, on my bank book here, and I have to foreclose on that property, and that half a million dollar note now becomes a non-performing asset, it's about five to one. So I'm not losing the ability to relend this half a million dollars, I'm losing the ability as the bank not to lend about two and a half million dollars. So they look at it very differently than you and I do. A lot of times that is why they will take a number much lower than we think they will. Right. The other thing too is, is they have an audit that they go through quarterly. They have an internal audit and they have an FDIC audit as well. Okay. They are not allowed to, by law, have more than a certain percentage of non-performing assets on their books. And as far as an internal audit goes, they don't want them to have those non-performing assets on their books because that means that they're exactly like Bill said, they're not able to bring in additional revenue because it's tying up funds that they could be lending out. The bank can take a loss on it because they're not eating it. They're writing it off. Okay. Just like we should be. If we take a loss on something, we're going to write it off as well. The bank, any other business that knows what they're doing is writing those losses off. The bank is wanting to get rid of that as quickly as possible in, in, in a normal functioning world. I didn't notice that necessarily in 2008, for some reason, banks were hanging on to because they thought the government was going to be buying these properties yeah. from them. Okay. But in a normal world where things work normally, the bank wants to get rid of it as soon as possible. And when I say as soon as possible, that doesn't mean the minute they get it, because honestly, the minute they get it, they really have no clue what they have. It has to go through its whole REO process. Uh, there's an REO department. If you have a, a institution that you work with, okay, go in, schmooze them, ask them to put you in touch with the person who is running their REO department. That can be your best connection. If you have the means to purchase these properties with cash, okay, oftentimes the director of the REO department will be able to contact you before they even place something with an agent and ask you if you're interested. And usually it won't be just one property. Typically, I'll have anywhere from three to five properties or back in 2006, seven, eight, we're buying entire, the slang term is, is tapes, okay? It was a catalog of properties and we were getting them from, from nationwide lenders. We had tapes that had properties from Detroit and Florida and Texas and California and Iowa and everywhere else. Um, but if you're able to buy them, you can make money. My, I'm, I'm getting a little off track. If you get in good with the person who is running the REO department, uh, you can kind of get the inside track. You may not necessarily have them say, hey, uh, do you want to buy this property? It may be a, hey, you know what? We've got a great property that we're getting ready to list with so-and-so that I think you should take a look at. And you could be the first person to contact that agent and go take a look at it and put a, an offer on it. So it's still a good inside track to have. And then something else before I forget about it, uh, Bill was talking about driving by and seeing vacant properties. And it's, it's, it's okay to see that vacant property, but remember, if you're walking around that property and you're putting your head in the window, if you find an open window or an open slider or anything else and you wanna walk around in that property, remember, you don't own that property, okay? That, do as, do as we say, not as we do, okay? You could still be arrested for trespassing, for walking around in that property. If something happens in that property and somebody spotted you there, there's a good chance they're gonna come and ask you what happened there. Um, and then last but not least, when I see those vacant properties that are on, on foreclosure, it's cha-ching for me because I don't get them in foreclosure. Usually if they've already walked away from the property, they're absolutely happy to work with you on something where they turn the note over to you and you can help them with their, their credit or anything else. They've already gone. You don't even have to negotiate cash for keys or anything else. So that goes back to our previous pre-foreclosure where if they've already left that property, 
your strategy should change right there. You should be looking at getting a hold of them as quickly as you can and negotiating something with them to where you can take over the note, you can start saving their credit, and you take control of that property. So we'll wrap up with this uh, for this podcast, and, and which is we're talking about banks, we're talking about audits. Now look, and Kevin said that uh, internal audits happen on a quarterly basis. The FDIC audit by law has to happen every two years. That audit is every single branch of, so like they go audit Bank of America, they're not going to the corporate headquarters, they're going to an individual branch and auditing that branch and all the records on that branch. Here's where that comes into play. So if, if there's um, an audit going on, the auditors in, for the most part, they are working they want to be helpful to the bank. They're not in there to, to beat the bank up. They're in there to say, hey, you got a problem here. Let's get this fixed. Kind of work together. And typically, uh, these audits, if you're looking at an a institution that has several hundred million, a branch that's several hundred million dollars or two or three billion dollars on deposit, that's an audit that's going to take probably a couple of weeks. So when they're doing that, they'll go back to the manager of that branch and say, hey, you know what, we found uh, there's eight uh, non-performing loans here that if you can get any of these sold before we're done with the audit, we won't count these against your branch audit. That's very important to all these banks. So if you have a relationship with the bank, and, and literally this could be a, a local branch manager, when the audit's going on, you can get a phone call from the bank manager. This happened for has happened with me before, where I've gotten phone calls and they've said, "Hey, look, got a couple of properties here. I need to get off the books. We're in audit, and if I can get it done quickly, let's do something." Well, if you've got money lined up, those are great calls to get, and you can go in and get a really sweet deal. But it's the speed of being able to react because you have your funding put together. But that audit thing is something the banks are always fearful of. The auditors are coming in. The auditors are coming in. We got to be in line. And so they work to get that very clean, uh, that portfolio as clean as they can. It's a great time to buy. I don't have any issues at all when I go to the bank just uh, talking to the manager and saying, hey, when's the last time you had an audit done? What that does is it, it allows me to make a middle note of, okay, so they, they just had one that completed in March of this year. They're going to be less flexible on some of those foreclosures in the next six months. But we start getting closer and closer and closer to the next audit coming around, and they get a little bit more aggressive in what they're willing to, to accept on a property. While we're so, uh, sorry, go ahead. Great call. Great podcast today. Real quick before we go, while we're talking about financing, and, and again, having financing is very important. And we've talked about being financially prepared. I've, we've shown so many people who are literally like this far from failure because they, they don't have another paycheck. They've, they've saved no money or anything else. Have, they're doing a lot of surveys on what people have spent their government stimulus checks on. I didn't get a stimulus check. I don't know about you. Yeah, but I, I didn't either. Um, <laughs> people are spending it. Have you heard some of these things, Bill? Update me, update me. It's okay. going to be fun. They were, they were lined up to get the new Air Jordans, and many of them said they were going to be buying those with their stimulus check. Um, electronics and toys were the number one and two things that people were buying with their stimulus checks. Alcohol and having a party or some sort of a social gathering, which they're not supposed to be having anyway, okay, uh, that they were spending on their stimulus checks. This goes to show the mentality of Americans in general. Most, most people, if you're thinking about it, okay, I know people who don't need the stimulus check and they put the money in the bank because yeah. it's extra money for them, okay? There are people who need the stimulus check who should be out there spending it on diapers and food and rent and gas for their car so they can go look for another job. And they're not. They're, they're, they're spending it on a new pair of Air Jordans that they can, I don't know what they're going to do with them, where they're going to wear them, you know? <laughs> be money smart. Use common sense, okay? And that has to do, that will equate. If you start doing that personally, 
okay? That will grow and that will equate all the way up to the same level as an investor. You can't say, I've got everything ready to, I've got the backing I need without having first personally put that together. I promise you, unless you have saved your own money to start this venture yourself, okay? You're not gonna find anybody who's gonna say, oh, here, let me give you my money, okay? So that you can mismanage it the way you've mismanaged your own money. So manage your own money correctly. Set that example, show that you're able to do that before you put your hand out to somebody else asking them to back you on a financial deal. Amen. I just, Amen. All right, brother. Hey, uh, great talking to you. Another uh, good podcast, sir. Good information. Good one in the can. And I will talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Y'all take care now.